So, how are you, Robin? You well? Yeah, I'm good. I'm a bit tired this week. My daughter had prom and very late, late night after party. And um, yeah, it's just an unusual week, out of routine completely for the whole week. Every day has been different. And even today, there wasn't any Luca stuff today, was there? Uh, I thought there was going to be. So I was up again, ready for it. But, uh... Well, I have to check onto the gym issue. And then Duncan, I think, um, he posted that he's, uh, Luca is not well. So there was no picture out today. Oh, okay. I've been missing it because he didn't do it last week and then he didn't do Monday. So, I mean, his updates are so useful, but I was dropping my daughter at a college orientation day this morning, so I couldn't listen anyway. So, on one hand, I was quite relieved that I didn't have to do a re-listen, you know, of the replay because I like to be there at the time. Yeah, that is the downside to having everything recorded is that um, you feel obliged to try and catch up and sometimes it's just impossible. <laughs> Yes, it's much, much better to try around. and organise your your diary to be there at the at the time. I think. I think I think yeah, I'm about there as well now. There are some things that is up on that recorded because you know, it got to a point where there's sort of 48 hours of recorded video for every 24 hours in a day, and <laughs> in the Cardano community, this is so I just haven't been able to keep up. Oh, well, I hope Luke is not too bad. I hope it's nothing major. Because he was off the week before on holiday, wasn't he? He was moving his son to Leeds on Friday last week. Moving into somewhere, I don't know, for uni, um, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, I think he's that age. Yeah. And then so he was at the whale yeah. thing on Monday and Tuesday. Yeah, Monday and Tuesday, the event. But the, we didn't go as well. And yeah, you better, Jaya, because you weren't well. Yeah, we are not well as well. So, and then also my daughter got the award function on Monday. So that's why I didn't go to NFT event. Mm -hmm. So instead, I went to my daughter's school. I, I didn't go either. So, um, it as well. so I feel like it's been last Monday, so not the Monday that's just gone, but two weeks Monday ago, really, that. I had any sort of, and last week, obviously, with Sphere 7, that's my crypto exposure in the last two weeks, which is like 50% or less than normal. Yeah. <laughs> You're feeling starved. I feel like I don't really know what's going on anymore and that I'm just waiting for these charts, and the rates, and, and I'm not, and they're sort of going up, but then they go down. Mm. So, yeah, I'm sort of yeah. bumbling along the bottom at the moment, aren't we? And, and you're just waiting and watching. Mm. I don't know what I'm waiting for, and I don't know what I'm watching. Like, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to see that's going to go, oh, okay, I'll go and do that or something. You know what I mean? I don't know what the trigger point is. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think at the moment the news is still uh, everybody get your holdings off the exchanges because um, they're still, uh, the, we're not hit the bottom yet. And the longer we're sort of in a no growth period, then the more at risk the centralized exchanges become. And the ones that have over leveraged themselves, they, they get exposed. So um, there was another one recently that um, I can't remember what they, what they were called now, but you know, Celsius has had issues. And there was another one that had just locked accounts. Um, BlockFi. BlockFi as well now, really. Well, then there was the Three Arrows Capital in um, Singapore, which mm -hmm. uh, also went uh, filed for bankruptcy. Um, so yeah, so there's is that there's a lot sort of um, kind of going on here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I think the I think FTX, the owner of the FTX exchange, I think, was going to to bid for BlockFi. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I did see him. So BlockFi yeah. was in trouble, and so FTX were going for that. And there was a, there was another one as well. I'm pretty sure I saw. Um. So yeah, ultimately, um, the rule is to get your money off the exchanges, into your own wallets, onto your cold storage, um, sit and wait it out for a while. <laughs> the 
the market's just just too too um, low at the moment, and uh, the people who have overstretched themselves are going to fall out. Um, so there was a um, there was a Twitter thread about exactly that, um, which resulted in me finding a a good, really simple video from some Cardano guys on um, why to get off the exchanges. Let me see if I can find it for you. Upstream. So upstream. Staking is a really easy way to earn uh, Upstream are guys I met in London um, when Luca came out with me to the Cardano event the other week. Um, good guys, there's seven of them, and they're starting to produce sort of really helpful content for um, uh, onboarding people into Cardano. So I'm very happy to pass these links on to you to any sort of. Um, Newbie topics you still haven't grasped, get in and see these guys' videos, they're good. And I and of course you can always request one for me as well. I I pull them out as needed. But there was one on here, particularly about getting things off the exchange, uh, that I thought was very good. Move off the exchange. So I'll whether you're a complete beginner or a crypto. I'll drop this one in the chat as well. That one's worth worth a watch. Mind you, you're all informed anyway, but it's good to keep passing these links around so everyone can see um, sources and where to pass them on to friends, colleagues, that sort of thing. Um, so could you say, are these like, um, who are upstream, did you say? So they're, they're guys who run another stake pool, um, and I met them in London uh, a couple of weeks ago for a, a gathering, and um, yeah, I met them all in person. They all seemed like straightforward guys, come out from traditional trades. You know, there was a, a photographer and a um, uh, web designer and, um, you know, your, your average guys, but they had seen the value in... Cardano, they'd watched Charles's whitelist um, whiteboard videos and uh, had got together to fund this pool, this stake pool. So they're now running that. Um, they're very, very young still, so not minted blocks yet, but um, they're producing video. And so this content that they're producing is um, is all pretty good quality. I think they've got some good vid videographer in their team and um, yeah, well worth a follow. And sort of any questions you have, useful ones about cold storage as well because I, I am not very well versed in that um she might help you get started with those Robin <laughs> with the ones you just found last week um well, on my to-do list on your to-do list yeah it's growing ever longer I imagine <laughs> so there was there was that and then oh yeah I also posted one quick how to um sorry I posted one quick how to this week for staking is a really easy way to earn passive uh seven and that was to do with getting um your uh your eternal wallet set up to stake so that's my latest video i'll drop that in the chat as well just in case anyone's interested my neural stake so it doesn't really interest you but again it's in the chat anybody that follows this later can catch up and follow it through Good, so any questions for today? Anything you're working on, struggling with? There was, um, Paul Dean turned up last week and brought uh, a new guy called Xander, who I, I think was hoping to join us today, but I don't know if he's in yet. Um, they might have some questions. But I, in I, the don't, meantime. I don't really have any questions, but I did put a note down on, I have, I always have a note for every meeting that we have, the Fluid7 and um, Luca's meeting. It's a bit like my post-it notes, but online, you mm -hmm. one note. And I just put in, has anybody, I must have looked at this, but I can't even remember. Has anybody heard about soul-bound tokens? Oh, yes. I did. Um, 
And is that the same thing as you were working on or that you're part of, Jonathan, with sort of this identity NFT development? And therefore, what is the difference? What is, is Soulbound not Cardano? Or? Um, so Soulbound uh, is a token design um, by Vitalik Buterin, who's the founder of uh, Ethereum. And um, it's an interesting paper uh, on an identity token um, that's related to NFTs. So the the exact specifics of it, I read about six months ago and can't remember an awful lot. But yeah, essentially, it's a it's a sort of expose or introduction to um, decentralized identity. Um, and reputation tokens and um, providing uh, proof of humanity on the on the blockchain. Um, so if you've got it seems to be unique and and a bit like what you were describing in that you you get to choose the bits of data or information that you want to share. You know, it's um, so what's different to what you're working on? What's the difference here? Or is it just Ethereum blockchain doing this, Solvan and Cardano doing your thing? Yeah, again with again with anything really, the differences are in the specifics. So um if you have uh if you approach one of the um uh one of the projects on Cardano building out similar systems like Profiler, they will have um all the in same intentions as Vitalik Solban tokens most likely, um, but it'll be in the implementation and, and how those are worked will be slightly different. Um, the the paper from Victalic didn't really bring anything new out. It was just a uh, sort of crystallization of uh, lots of thought by lots of people in the blockchain space about how we move from being all uh, anonymous or pseudonymous um, into actually having a way to interact with a proof of humanity um, sort of stance and yeah this is exactly the same sort of uh, concepts that are being worked on in the in the Atala prison program from Cardano and um, in the various projects around that like um, Profiler and Roots Wallet and things like that so these guys are all um, working to bring about the same things that are in that paper as um, he was doing it for Ethereum we're doing it for Cardano and and again, yes, it will be that, that case of having a, a way to prove who you are without saying um, your whole life history uh, in a in an exchange with a doorman at a pub. <laughs> You'll be able to just release information that's pertinent to that particular relationship, transaction, point in time. So is this just also, a, a, they've coined, so to speak, the fancy word, soul band? Yeah, well, it's a good word. And branding and marketing and uh having the right phrases are essential so yeah he's done really well with that i think um I, mean, I, I get it and i've read it but there's a small a very small part of me that almost thinks it's a bit creepy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what i mean it's like you want i understand the concept of the uniqueness and it's and everybody's soul is unique but i'm like you know my soul's pretty private Mm -hmm. Even like not even the sections I want to share are shareable. If that makes sense, it's like it's still pretty. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to convey it. But you're messing with my soul. I don't know. It's a bit creepy. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, and what you have to sort of accept is that currently our souls are wrapped up by single entities, um, our digital identities, which is the most comprehensive. Um, description of our soul uh, is owned by Facebook, by LinkedIn, um, by Google. They have more data points on each of us than uh, we do ourselves. And they know, know with exact, you know, historical recollection, everything that we've been doing for the past 10 years, probably, um, and however long we've been on these platforms. And so that is, you know, effectively, our souls the description of our souls. If someone wants to know details about you or to profile you or to try and gauge what your decision will be over any particular thing or how to influence you, these guys have all the information, have all the data. Um, 
and that's what we're trying to battle against. So um, when you when you are recognizing that that is a valuable thing, um, because you can have tailored services, you can only see stuff in life that's of interest to you. Um, you can still stay in touch with your social networks back over you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, then uh, you've got to find a way to take the power back from single entities and create a system that keeps the power with you as an individual and doesn't leave it in the hands of, um, of Facebook, of Meta. Um, I suppose the use of soul, maybe it's not creepy, it's more um, an uncomfortable confirmation, like you're, you're describing of you know our data is out there, like Tesco knows what I eat, <laughs> mm. you know, but I'm okay with that. But this is, other people wouldn't be, and it's the reframing in your mind, how you how you process these things for yourself. Um, and, and maybe the word soul, for me, it, it's not necessarily creepy, it's just more like an uncomfortable truth. Yeah, there's some honesty in using the word soul <laughs> that, uh, <Yes. laughs> that leaves you feeling more vulnerable. Which again is a good thing to to think because, I mean, it, it, my university housemate from back in the nineties recognised um, um, supermarket um, membership cards were a really threatening thing because you know there's so much information you can gather from somebody's groceries list um, <laughs> on who they are and what they're likely to be vulnerable to. Um, and this information about how many donuts you buy as a teenager will pay dividends to an insurance company who's going to offer you life insurance in, in 20, 30 years' time. And that information is all out there, and it's all owned by these private organizations that are all interlinked, and they can all share data within the bounds of their umbrella groups. And, um, yeah, it's time to take back that data, put it in the hands of the individual so that we can release the parts of it. We can take custody of it and we can release the parts of it that are relevant, that are we that we're okay to share. Like you're okay to share your groceries at this point, but you know, it's those of us who are, aren't well versed. I mean, you know, all of us are naive in several aspects. We don't know how it's going to be used in the future, but this data is crucial and it's, and it's part of the whole move of, um, move to blockchain that I really appreciate because there's got to be a balance between privacy and functionality. The same as in crypto, we've got um, the balance between security and functionality. Um, there's always a, a yin to a yang. There's always balance to things and finding that point is really something that should be retained by the individual, I think. Um, so yeah. I'm not very exposed in the Ethereum world. When I when I started being interested in crypto and watching Luca and stuff, you know, he's so focused, like you are on, on, on Cardano, that I'm probably a little bit influenced myself by that. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the, can you remind me of the name? You said a Atelier or something. What's the Cardano equivalent then of this soul bound? Um, yeah, so the 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 protocol that's being written by IOG um, is Atala Prism. And um, let me just put a note on the, what we were just talking about there because that's interesting. Um, so Atala Prism is a protocol designed by IOG to um, enable the storage of decentralized identities and um, all the systems that will go with them over time. So the um, that's the program that I'm studying on very slowly. <laughs> I don't have enough time in the day. Um, but there is a an app from IOG themselves. You can go and try it out, test it out. It's not hugely functional yet. Um, but uh, the sort of the widest implementation of this is um, the student identity system in Ethiopia which um, was a deal broken between IOG and the Ethiopian um, Education Department and the government. Um, they will use blockchain, Cardano blockchain, as the storage mechanisms for student identities. And they're hoping to onboard 15 million students in the country to it. And they've made a start now. 
um, and it's step by step. There's volatility in the government in Ethiopia, so that's delayed things somewhat. But the technology is there and it's being used. And Tony Rose was one of my lecturers. Um, and somewhere I'm looking for it, you can actually go and download the um, the app. But again, as well, just a really good place to get grounding on the technology that's out there. This is written by a private company. IOG, who are building technology and looking to make uh, a living off the back of it. Um, but that means they've got all the resource and all this, all the copywriters who will condense the technology into palatable sentences. So it's a good place to learn from. Um, and bear in mind that this technology is a layer that's being created. And then on top of that, anybody can come because it's open sourced. Anybody can come and build their own implementation from it. So um the the uh the, the community projects that i mentioned were uh profiler i'm going to go to their twitter accounts because that's actually where i get most of my news these days I, you know i was a bit shocked this morning to hear there's been a um a shooting in japan of a former prime minister which is shocking just as our prime minister heads out the door um, which isn't so shocking. <laughs> uh, so I was going to look for Profiler. These guys are building an identity solution on top of um, Atala Prism. So that's a project to look out for. They do have a token, I believe. Um, another one is... The Roots Wallet team, which I don't know if I follow. I don't know if they have a Twitter presence. Um, where can I find them? In fact, I think I'm on a Discord server, so I might. So this is their Discord server where they do the building. Um, I don't know if they've got any link to a website or anything as of yet, but it's a it's a project that has got in it um, a development team that I really respect. Um, the guy in here, George Lovegrove, is a really good thinker. Again, a friend of mine from I'm um, seen in London a couple of times now. Um, and he's, uh, so I've done some paid work for him actually, uh, on working on a credential system. Um, but we're now waiting for the infrastructure from this Roots Wallets team to really build up so that we can get um, the community credentials that we want to build out, built on top of this one in particular. Um, oh, there we go, uh, they do have a website. Grab that and drop it in as well. Once it loads, it's taking a while. So, was there any any particular questions? Any um, like, are you interested in the, the identity stuff as a as a way something to get invested in early on, or um, just a just a well, personal I, I use? I like the idea of it when you've spoken about it before. You know, with the like almost like your driver's license side of thing. You know, why do you need to flash the whole card and, and give everything when really what they're after is proof of age or something? Mm. Um, and and I just note, and because I this was on a Nexo newsletter, Soulbound. Oh, I don't okay. always read the newsletters because it's just too much information sometimes when you get all these emails. It's a bit, you know, oh, I don't have time to read that. But I, ju I just, I suppose the word soul caught my attention. 
And I thought, oh, what's that related to crypto? That sounds a bit dodgy, actually. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And I was like, what is that? And then when I read it, I was like, okay, no, no, this is more like a, an identity thing. And that's why I put it in the question to you because I thought, oh, Jonathan's spoken about that already mm. on the Cardano platform. Yeah, yeah. And it is a fascinating piece of of um, technology that will built on blockchain um, that really interests me. And the, and the, the soul bound is a good word again, because, um, you know, a lot of a lot of this will touch in areas that we um, were you know, we're battling with currently. And before the recording started, actually, and I were talking about um, the processes and the length and the pain involved in exchanging property between, you know, somebody wants to buy, somebody wants to sell. And then there's, you know, three months minimum before that process completes anything up to a year and you know it's a it's a it's a horrible painful process to go through and that can be optimized and made more efficient with the use of blockchain technology where there's you know there's a historical record of a property's uh, provenance of all the searches that done against it can be stored um, and um, whose name was put against doing that search at the time and whether that's going to be accepted by this new vendor and so on and so forth um, as well as um, you know inheritance rights and creating your will and you know what you what you pass on. I'm reading a couple of interesting novels at the moment um, uh, called uh, Soul Soul Identity, dear Soul some, Soul something again. Uh, I suppose this will help as well when they they talk about things like. Um... So, iTunes library or I think ages ago I saw something like you could when you die you couldn't hand it down you have to like have it written in a will something and and have powerful lawyers behind you to be able to like gift your you know digital assets into your family or something I I remember seeing maybe it's all fixed now because this was a, a few years ago where there was something in the news about somebody had iTunes library, you know, and the amount of money that was invested in purchasing that, and then when they died, it just disappeared because exactly there was nothing, you know. And there was like a contention about, you know, I put it in my will, you know what I mean? That the family were like, it's 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 specified in the will that we inherit this. And they were mm-hmm. like, well, there's no precedent for this, and how do we know? Yeah. It was like an argument. How do we know he even had it? You're like, well, it's on his account. <laughs> and you've got the purchase history. You yeah, know? yeah. They were like, okay, but it's only tied to him. He didn't purchase it for the rest of your family. And you're like, no, no, no. When, when you inherit something, like a house, you know, if it's in your parents' name, it's not in your name until they die. <laughs> yeah, no, that is still not sorted out. Um, yeah. And it... And it you know, tied in the, the novel I read is called Soul Intense at the moment, which is second in the series, and the the whole problem of um, like your Amazon library as well, your Kindle um, yeah. library, that's not owned by you as an individual. You're just renting access to the books. So if you stop paying your account or um, um, yeah, if you die, you can't pass it on to your children. Um, and so the whole Great Reset the whole uh, Aldous Huxley, you will own nothing and you will be happy, is uh, is what we're living in now, and we don't really realise it, um, and it's becoming more and more obvious because of the digital stuff. Um, if you want to pass on, um, you know, the bulk of our wealth will be stored up and described in digital means, in digital ways. Um, now and definitely by the end of our lifetimes i imagine so how we pass that on is is crucial and and this soul bound um uh um, what's it? yeah it is soul bound isn't it I'm gonna, oh, i think the book's called soul bound as well the first one so that that's a it's a um it's a this is a precursor this is a time before all that really starts to um hit the wall because if you can get your your digital assets described and written up into a will um and your executor may not even need to be named um it will just be uh, a a, cu- a couple of incidences 
that will require your bill to be activated. So maybe it's the signing of a death certificate um, and that will suddenly be signed off by your doctor in the hospital and that will trigger a smart contract um, on the blockchain that actually is the executor of your will. So if you've got described on the blockchain what happens to your assets one way or the other, um, then it will be executed instantly at point of death, say, or maybe there may be, okay, we'll give it a couple of days, make sure he's in the ground before, because <laughs> we never know what technology is going to be available <laughs> for resurrecting us later on. Um, so maybe we, you know, there's a period, time period, and then your your assets all get released and distributed um, um, from wallet to wallet. And so, you know, Archie will be able to sell her property to um, the 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 purchaser um with you know the click of a finger say i'm i want the trans funds transferred into an escrow account which the smart contract controls i will um transfer the deeds over to that escrow account too and when that happens the escrow account smart contract will release the assets in the opposite directions and that exchange is made and it's done and dusted no lawyers needed to be involved um um so long as the, the underlying technology is done and the requirements are met, then things like wills, execution of wills and transfer of property can happen um, without the headaches. So it's a powerful, glorious and risky future. Um, and so having lots of papers, lots of bright minds thinking and talking about it um, now is crucial and educating so that the the masses can input into these discussions, into these descriptions, into the tools that get built out is, is crucial as well because there's so many little niche circumstances and scenarios that need to be thought through before everything gets put into a smart contract and <laughs> find it can never be released. Um, and suddenly we've locked up all our assets into a contract that nobody then owns um, because it, for some reason it can't be executed. executed. But um, yeah, these are really fascinating things that uh, are starting to be thought and talked about um, in the mainstream which is which is great so any other topics any other questions people want to bring up Jaya Archie <clears throat> not really Jonathan I'm just working through my uh, to-do list and working on my you know wealth pyramid and portfolio Mm. So I've gone back to back to basics. Back to basics, yeah. It was interesting. I was thinking about that. Where do you put um, Cardano in your uh, wealth pyramid? For me, it's foundation, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I put it, yeah, because I, I I've, I've got my top um, five crypto crypto, which are Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, Polkadot, and Chainlink. My yes. class those as my foundation assets because they're ones that I'm going to be holding for the long term. Mm -hmm. Really good. I I'm fully on with that with that as well, and treat those like long term assets as well. But then it's interesting because you can actually, um, you can take your ADA and leverage it, and suddenly it becomes a high risk asset. <laughs> Yes, um, if you wanted to trade it, yeah. So it could actually sit even in the act of trading or if you were trading, you know, kind of Cardano. And yeah. then I was thinking, you know, wholesale cash flow, if you're staking it, and that would, and you're able to generate um, a monthly income, that could also, <laughs> you know, kind of live at the, um, you know, kind of uh, cash flow on level two. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, so with with pure just staking which is the safest um uh way to grow your ada holdings um it's just put it in a stake pool and watch it grow at four or five percent a year um that is really low risk because there's really nothing that can happen to that ada um if you want to get higher return so you want to put it into that sort of cash flow bracket um because five percent a year is not really gonna i mean you're gonna have to have hold so much to actually <laughs> and a living off yeah. of that um but you you could move it into um some other other ways so there was an interesting release from um 
not which dex was it, I think it's min swap. Um, Archie, what did you say your five were? Bitcoin, Cardano, Polkadot, Chainlink, and Ethereum. Ethereum. I always forget about Ethereum. I think it's because it's when I entered the crypto world, the gas fees were so high that it was just like, okay, I, I, don't, I don't even go there. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, basically, Bitcoin and Ethereum were my largest holdings, but now it's become Cardano. So that's mm -hmm. actually my, my my biggest holding. I don't have very much in crypto world as well, but my Cardano, because of the third seven pool even, is probably my biggest holding. I And the Bitcoin I have is like XO related, you know, or referral related, like 0001 coin <laughs> you know those sorts of amount but I, I did um I did buy a bit of polka dot and chain link a while back like in early days when from Luca learning from Luca um and I think have you done any due diligence on the chain link because I've only really listened um watched some information about and I like how it's related to the fiat world and the crypto world and that crossover yeah exactly that's what I liked about it but I, I was a little bit concerned when I saw that they were involved with the world economic forum that kind of got me a little bit <laughs> you know, yeah. sort of, um, a little bit concerned but no but I, I, I yeah um, I, I think that kind of um, uh, like you say the uh, you know the interoperability between the uh, you know, our current financial system and the blockchain world, I think it's really important. So, um, yeah, the, um, it's interesting, Chainlink is actually part of the JED ecosystem as well, which is a stable token that's coming out on Cardano. Um, so the, so IOG again wrote um, stable coin um, uh, white paper and JED is an Israeli development house that are building out the technology and they've got it four to eight times um, collateralized, over collateralized in terms of um, how much backing of crypto they have to their um, their JED token, backing of ADA they have to their JED token. So if the price has gotten down, it's much more stable than most of the other stable coins out there. Um, but they also use Chainlink in that ecosystem. It's quite a complex little ecosystem um, and so, yeah, I, I did start to look at Chainlink, but I haven't had a proper look. So anything you do find and sh can share, Archie, Robin, I'd be really interested in. Um, so, yeah, I was thinking about these these cash flashes. So, so MinSwap, I'm not sure if it is MinSwap, but there's, there's certainly now more and more innovative ways of uh, trying to get really high yield on your on your ADA. Now, this is risky. This is stuff that I don't um, do myself um with ada i have done it with some other tokens that i don't really care about <laughs> but i like to accrue my ada slow and steady keep it safe um but you can get much higher um, returns by um pairing your ada holdings with another token putting it into um the exchanges to provide liquidity for other other people buying and selling um and so if you if you are looking to build out a cash flow strategy so like this one is actually quite interesting to me because I rate the Enmake token um, really highly and of course I rate Ada very highly um, and I hold some Enmaker which I've already you know done got a really good return on from when I bought in um, so I potentially could put say half of that um, still have all the money I put in originally I could take half and put it into a, a high yield liquidity ball like this um, and actually start to look at some really good um, uh, cash flow um, and you know if as long as that's a small enough portion proportion of your wealth holdings then then um, I think that's a good strategy as well so uh, you know I'm I'm not doing not doing it now but it probably will at some point look at getting involved in some of the more high risky high return high risk stuff um but again i just like to be slow and steady learn from a safe distance watch uh watch what happens to other people <laughs> before i dive in 
I, I, I'm the same, Jonathan. Yeah. So I'm currently. I mean, I for my cash flow, I I'm looking at. Um, I have invested in one of Chad Pope's structured notes, so the crypto one. Mm. Uh, that he did. Um, yeah, I'm mean, very interested in Chad's yeah. stuff, cash box. Do you get you basically get paid quarterly? I didn't have the, I think, did you, that was the one that you only needed five for, but typically the cash box, they want 10, don't they? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The minimum investment for that one was 5,000. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So getting into the, into the door on some of these is, um, yeah. still feels like quite a, putting it out there, but you know, at some point it's got to be better than, um, I mean, I've always looked at property previously. But the you know that as a cash flow i just see being taken away from us um absolutely and it's not getting i mean when you think the amount that you know you invest in property and what kind of um you know return on investment you're getting i mean i i, I mean for my property i was getting less than five percent and i mm. just thought it's not worth it mm. yeah <laughs> that's well. why i'm kind of moving from that hence you know i'm selling you know, kind of part of my portfolio because I think I can get a much better return on investment and also have the advantage of the um, liquidity as well. You know, if it takes you like a year to release your um, equity, yeah, <laughs> it's like you know, yeah, 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 yeah. it's ridiculous. I think for for someone like me who's not in property either, but sort of like maybe had a bit of FOMO, you know, like everybody else got into this property should I have done or have I missed the boat now and you know, um, the thing I'm keeping an eye on is wealth migrate which mm. is, comes recommended mm -hmm. through IAW so I listen to their sort of free webinars and things like that and, and their platform IAW was offering a $100 bonus sign up so if you it's a bit like going through your KYC and setting up your I see that as like cash box global you know you would you'd need to set up an online account and you'd need to have a username and all that kind of stuff you can do the same with wealth migrate and they're just finishing their fca approval which they had but disappeared with the brexit shuffle thing you know so they had to reapply but um apparently it's imminently due imminently could be anything between now and the end of the year okay. mm -hmm. um but you could for, for the property side of things they seem to have a history and a um, a knowledge of the of the property and from again I haven't gone into the detail yet because it's not ready to use so it's like useless information at the moment you could possibly they're trying to merge the crypto world and the tokenized property world I think mm -hmm. away and provide people with investment opportunities for something as little as dollar ten dollars so you can be in the game paying for a small amount that you don't feel is risky so if you look at something like the 100 dollar china recommendation referral through iaw to me it's a bit like top cash back you know that's like the free money so if you're going to give me a hundred dollars it didn't all i had to do to get that was be referred through iaw and then i could play with that on their platform mm -hmm. I, I could see what you can do with that it's not going to place any cash flow for me at the moment but it, i see it as like a little safe upper mm -hmm. to learn how to do something like that yeah and I, I i saw scott pick and speak um four or five years ago now and loved his passion and enthusiasm then and his desire to see investment open up to the masses because you know, cash box global is a link in there as well they actually have one of their investments that you can partake in if you look up if you were to find something like their current portfolio there's only four things that you can buy into at the moment and one of them is a cash box global you go through wealth migrate still oh, okay like the portfolio that they have to offer you is four things and one of them is a cash box global structured note <laughs> Right. Okay, we we can't uh, invest on those. Yeah, at the mm -hmm. moment. That's right. So you were able to before Brexit, apparently. And then because they have to do 
because the FCA is so stringent here in the UK, they and they're an international company, they had to go through more like a reapplication of the FCA approvals or whatever it's called. Yeah. So and that's why I was also waiting for that to go through the FCA route. So when it depends, yeah, I think that's the best option if you wanted to go to, to the property investment rather than go directly into the properties. Yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to say is that I was quite interested in that, you know, in that I feel I've missed the boat with property because it's it's outside of my budget. It's, and like Archie is saying and you're saying, Jonathan, your, your money's tied up and too much of it for too long for the return and the effort that's involved in it. Whereas if you're just looking from an investment point of view as opposed to you know, managing your property, I don't know whether I'm just being naive, but you know, if you just wanted to be investing, almost earning a return, <laughs> you seem to be able to do it on a smaller scale through Wealth Migrate. You don't have to own the whole property. You could be part of a group of people that are providing the finance and then getting the, the return as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that sort of fractionalised uh, ownership is a way to really empower the masses. So African investors on um, you know salaries that just don't compete with the north actually could could be investing in you know from a dollar a day, which is Scott Pickens uh, um, target. You know, starting with a dollar that would be phenomenal. Be able to get involved in owning property from that level. Um, and property globally as well. That's what I like about it. Too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can the diversification by having, you know, property all over the world. And they particularly like, um, like doctors' surgeries and, and things like that. Don't they in this, in yeah. uh, in the states. Uh, yeah, pointing out the obvious things to you, saying that these these are it's a bit like commodities that get pointed out to you in the stock markets, isn't it? Though it's like you might have all this inflation and and all these prices and, and worry going on. But at the end of the day, everybody needs ice <laughs> and everybody needs milk, you know? So these things are, unless somebody stops eating, you know, if people stop eating certain things, those are the kind of things that are you're always, so medical things are always going to be needed in mm. some form. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other, the other one that, um, it's worth mentioning the same sort of breath is crowd property, um, the prop in, which is open to the UK, um, run by Simon Zucci, head of Property Investors Network. Um, the problem with it at the moment is that the deals are so few and far between, and they get snapped up so quickly. It's just hard to get <laughs> to get in on them, um, and they are found foundational sort of investments as well. But you're you are crowd um, purchasing or or crowd funding property deals. And developments um so a good way to get in onto uh, property without actually having to plump up for the whole and um, building yourself and get involved in the the bricks and mortar um yeah. and what i like about crowd property is they also do their due diligence as well mm. so you know kind of because uh, it's very difficult for you to do your own obviously you still have to do your own but to have a platform where <clears throat> the, all the projects have already been assessed so they'll only lend on projects that they know will meet, you know, their criteria. So mm -hmm. that's really good. And another one that I invest with is called Shojin. Um, it's H O J I N. They're really good. Um, and again, they're FCA regulated, and uh, you can invest. I think the minimum investment is five thousand pounds. Okay. So is it a similar thing, fractionalized? Similar thing, or? yes. Yeah, yeah, and you can also invest through what they call an innovative finance ISA, so um, which is really good because it means that you get your interest paid tax free. Hmm. That's uh, you know, the magic magic phrase has been. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know those at all. So that's really good. I'm going to go have a read about yeah, those. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And you know this this sort of knowledge and access to markets um, 
is really coming about um, through uh, the digital world. You know, the, ex the mass exposure to information and, you know, everything is moving from a paid model on the internet to a free model um, um, is really positive, I think. Um, and everything gets more and more uh, regulated and stabilised the more exposure it has. So at the moment, crypto is still small and niche and volatile and risky and the press is all bad about it. Um, and that will change over the next few years as it becomes more accepted and recognised and where bills get passed to, to accept and adopt it and it, the regulation starts to happen. Um, so it is, it is interesting. There was a a cant, another um, American congresswoman online um, saying that she wants to bring digital voting to America, which is for their you know uh, national elections, which I think is a um, seems like a no brainer to me. Why on earth are we still doing um, private ballot <laughs> voting <laughs> systems? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I think they'll get it in for the next election though in twenty twenty four. No, I don't. <laughs> I'm sceptical. <laughs> uh, purely because I think it really needs a uh, proper national digital identity system. And um, we don't really have one yet. So the closest we've got is the passport. Not everybody holds a passport and everybody has to uh, of, the voting, of the voting public. So until we've got a lightweight um, uh, national identity system, um, that's that's open, that's decentralised, and not um, you know state owned and run. Um, I don't think it's going to you know a voting system is going to come off the back of it. Um, and it, yeah, I don't know whether there will be a because um... the thing that gets me is that you know everything everything used to be about well you you can't you you have to trust the government to do these sorts of big things like that, but then. When um, you know, like the pandemic hit, um, everything got outsourced. <laughs> Literally, every part of the pandemic handling just got outsourced to uh, private entities. Um, and so, all the work that was done, the apps that were built, none of it was really government um, owned, controlled, produced. It was all just outsourced. And so, who's really holding the tech? Who's really got the the hands on on the that powerful data set. Um, um, sure, government has access to it, but they don't own, they don't actually control. And it's been through the community, you know, the private companies um, first and foremost. And, you know, our data has gone into it and it's now, you know, sitting there hidden somewhere for privacy. But actually, it'd be far better if it was sitting in a, you know, and who builds it? I don't mind. Um, there's a very little difference between a government commissioned project and a private one because nine seems to be 90 percent of the time anything gets parceled out to private anyway so i don't i love private i am a private you know <laughs> um organization with fluid seven um, so i don't mind those guys building stuff um i just want it to be owned by everybody not by um not locked up in silos and once we get that with an identity system um then we can get the voting done, click of a finger, and, and that would be a much sense, much more sensible system. Um, thinking through, same as anything, but yeah, it just is, seems like a priority. <laughs> with, uh, with the amount of time and effort people are putting into voter fraud and influencing with you know, large scale data analysis and AI algorithms, um, we need to, properly decentralize the decision-making power to the individual human um, and getting to the point where we can actually know who is a human and who isn't, it seems like a very easy first step to, to get done. I, I say that glibly, sounds like, <laughs> I know it's not, but it sounds like it should be and seems like a pr high enough priority enough. If we can get man to the moon in the 60s, then we can probably sort out, figure out who's human on the planet Earth. No, or is that just me? <laughs> We rattled through a whole load of really good things there. Did I put Shojin in there? I did good. And we've captured all these into our Discord server. So anybody that does catch this later wants to catch up on the links. Um, we've captured them all inside the Discord server. So do join. I'll drop um, 
uh, yeah, I'm, I may drop an invite to the Discord server into the YouTube description so you can catch it there as well and join us if you haven't seen, if you're not not in the server already. Um, but yeah, do come along and join. We have interesting discussion about this every week. So it's nice to sort of broaden it out to wider kind of investment discussions as well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And you know, it's still relevant to blockchain and Cardano because everything's yeah, going to go to there. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're looking to actually adopt blockchain technology in the future. So great. Really. <laughs> Jonathan, just a quick um, query. Like uh, you have shown us uh, earlier on about the high cash flow, like uh, Cardano liquidity. Mm. What's the link? What's that the was. Link that we need to go to Cardano, or. So that was MinSwap. I was looking at. Um, okay, MinSwap. I'll drop that in the chat as well. Um. So they are. Uh, they're a. They're a. I think they were funded originally by Project Catalyst again, so real grassroots um, um, team born out of the community. Um, lots of people rate them as a, a highly valued um, team on the Cardano ecosystem. The DEX launched uh, very early on in terms of DEX launches on Cardano. Um, the They did launch with a vulnerability, which another DEX found and shared with them um but actually this lately it's come out that there was a whole load of um you know the other the other decks were, were really holding holding to ransom a little bit so that was uh wing riders so it's wing riders came out like the good guys in there but they weren't 100 percent good guys they they weren't very generous with their knowledge um and it was actually paid for um bounty for the bug um in the end but min swap uh, fixed it launch there was no um um no actual uh, implementation of that vulnerability um so uh, all all the exchanges go through the same audit processes this one wasn't found the others had theirs found so it's um you know there is technology that's young that needs to be bunged up minswap has since had no issues for the past six months um and are offering um a lot of functionality that the others don't yet um and so yeah well worth a look and some of these so, so can we do it take through the eternal wallet or do i need to go to min swap and then buy and uh, liquidity pool we need to do so to get involved yeah, they accept all these wallets um so you there are they use a dap connector um so you can attach your eternal wallet to the site and then you can use that to move your ADA into the smart contracts that manage these liquidity pools. Um, so, yeah, worth looking at um, if you're interested in that. And again, I would be very cautious, very careful, sit and watch for a long time before jumping in. Um, only put in what you're very happy to lose, um, and yeah, I pick pairs wisely. And the the nice thing about MinSwap is that they are they have lots of community token liquidity pools as well. So, um, like Nmaker is a small development team that's been in from the very early days of um, Cardano. Uh, Patrick Topo is very active on all social media and open to question in questions and contributes a lot um and um it's a community token so you know that the um you know it's it's not being pumped by venture capital backing these tokens they're just trying to build up from the grassroots um and so yeah I'm, I'm much more comfortable in that space than um being on platforms and working with tokens that have a whole load of cash thrown in to make it look like a really good deal if something's grown up slowly from you know clawed their way up then with their nails i feel more comfortable about them and the success that they've achieved than i do about somebody that's come in with you know a whole load of wall street cash yeah is there any like a time frame for these or like a three months six months you have to be there 
Okay. Maybe on that, maybe I can check. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked in, I haven't, I haven't done it myself. So yeah, that's another. You know, use your own, do your own research for it. Um, but again, the time frames, uh, I think it's fairly flexible. So you could probably jump in and out pretty quickly if you just want to do short term ones. Um, um, but yeah, you get those those higher hard yield returns, um, and, uh, and my sort of feel that actually this is probably the right point in the market to get involved in something like this because the it's very bearish. Everybody's very skeptical of getting returns, and so if if you're involved now, the prices have lost the bulk of their um, fluff, <laughs> and they're are you know back down to sensible levels as there's very little inflate um you know inflated prices i as i see it um in most of these now so good time to to start experimenting thank you and also i think it's the same question to goes to archie as uh, archie said like a pardon we can all design a foundational asset so mm -hmm. if this cash flow comes where do you put is as a like compounding as a like a foundational asset or you keep it separately like the cash flow separately and then the main asset as a like a foundation yeah, it's definitely higher up the pyramid in in my mind <laughs> probably in the high risk at the top what about you archie yeah i put it in the the very top actually not even cash flow because it's more me kind of staking up you know i I, I always get really concerned when I see these really high um, yields because I always ask, well, how are they generating <laughs> the money to be able to pay such a high yield? And, you know, kind of, um, yeah. So, okay. yeah, so I put something like that quite high up. Mm. Yeah, I, I almost was thinking I should form my pyramid in a way that, you know, the percentage yield just triggers the next layer up so if something something's on 15 yeah. percent, and that's you know breaking into high <laughs> high yield territory that's starting to look like a, a risk asset um and you know certainly um uh celsius offering 20 percent just from staking that that raised flags in my mind um and you know even even binance is eight percent I think is fairly safe, but starting to feel a bit more and more risky as well because you've got a centralized entity um, using relying on the the earnings from their holdings that they've staked elsewhere um, to really offer that eight percent, nine percent on ADA. Um, whereas with Cardano native staking, which all my, all the community pools offer, uh, there is no control. I don't have any say in um, with that rate of return. It's written into the protocol, um, which is which is locked in the blockchain. Nobody can change it. So the rules there are um, are set in stone in terms of potential yield, potential returns. Um, the only um, impact I can have is on the variable fee that I take out as a pool operator, and the um, minimum fee can actually be changed by um, protocol parameter changes, which again is done by uh, a very slow methodical process within IOG at the moment, and that will eventually be moved over to the community. Um, but yeah, we will, we will never see 10% returns on Cardano native staking. It's always gonna be, I mean, about five and a half is a maximum you can get at the moment, and that will diminish over time as well. Um, so the, the returns you're getting now will actually be higher than the ones in five years time um, because it is going to stand it's going to veer towards stability and um, security as a whole so there are early adopter rewards that are being handed out at the moment across the board and that's why you see um, you know very high reward opportunities um, because you're willing to take that risk of being an early adopter but that will diminish over time as it becomes more standardized and safe. I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where we're only getting 0.005% like our banks give us. Um, <laughs> but never say never. <laughs> yeah, liquidity pool, some of them, it says, like, allocated point. 
it's some of a very minimum 0 0.19 so some of them whereas it says like the 54 mm -hmm. does make um, any difference or, or maybe somebody already put the um, that liquid GD, that's why it's higher up is yeah. that how it works yeah it looks like some kind of figure on how um yeah how much is in there already um relative figure so yeah again i'm i yeah i'd have to read about it before i got involved um, to understand exactly and i i do know that on other exchanges um you may get um two different tokens um two different liquidity pools um of the same token pair um one with a higher return than the other um and that's sort of reflected in as a liquidity provider whether you get higher higher yield or or slightly lower um, so you can almost pick your risk going into some of these pools pairings as well. Um, it looks like these are all unique though, so I, I guess MinSwap's got a different system. Okay. Yeah, it'd be interesting if you do go and research. It'd be great to hear your your thoughts in future weeks, because we all learn best as we learn together. Did you see if there was? Coinbase wallet there. Coinbase. Just have an idea. You know how you can earn free tokens sometimes on the learn and earn places? Mm. I've got like these random tokens sitting in Coinbase. I'm just wondering if you could connect it to something like this. Again, we would be playing free money. Yeah. Got, like learning how to do it here. Yeah. And seeing what the result is, you know, when you say something that you're willing to lose. Mm -hmm. Well, all I had to do was answer multiple choice questions on Coinbase to get some render token, for example. Mm. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I don't know whether that Coinbase. I assume it has. I just haven't Cardano tokens, you know, like the Cardano platform. Uh, yeah, I. Again, Coinbase is a um, a third-party chain, private centralized exchange, um, and their wallet is not native to any of the blockchains. So the what's open to you to do in there will really be within the Coinbase ecosystem, as far as I understand. So um, you're earning tokens that you've earned. They choose as to where you can use them. So. Um, the likelihood of being able to do it in something like uh, Minslop, Muesli Slop, Sunday Swap are very slim um, oh, because yeah. Coinbase wouldn't get any benefit from that. Um, things like, um, so what is what is coming is more and more interoperability between chains. So the, the exchanges that are have issued tokens on um, the Ethereum um, blockchain they will start to appear in Cardano because we've got now the Ethereum virtual machines um, from Milcomeda. Um, so wrapped tokens from other chains from Ethereum specifically can come over to Cardano now and back again. Um, so like Binance uses a lot, holds a lot of tokens that are on the Ethereum chain. I'm sure Coinbase does as well. I don't have a Coinbase account. Um, but they will, they will, you can potentially then move your tokens from those exchanges into um, Ethereum wallets and then over into Cardano and then you can participate and um, you could create a liquidity pair with Binance USD probably in a, in a Cardano exchange now if you really put the effort in to, to do something like that. Um, but again, all quite young, all quite um, uh, unknown documentation will be sparse and success will probably not be well documented um but an interesting experiment if you wanted to try it i'd be interested certainly there's a there's a whole load of tech coming with uh with side chains so the vassal hard fork is coming up in um a few weeks time uh, that is the next big release, software release on the Cardano blockchain. Um, so just like back in September, when the prices of Cardano peaked, um, we're now having an even 
because of that software release that was happening in September, we've got now an even bigger release happening with this Vassal hard fork um, that is bringing huge amounts of power to developers and ecosystem builders. Um, so very exciting from a, from a development standpoint, and it will mean um, uh, better outcomes for uh, us as individuals participating in the ecosystem, just not yet. It's going to take a while for the new apps to be released and the upgrades to come. Um, but it's exciting in that um, some of the benefits that are coming with this hard fork, Vassal hard fork, are that um, uh, the size and the rates that the blockchain is growing in terms of its physical disk space usage will slow down because there's a whole lot of efficiencies being brought in. Um, you'll have the option of not having the whole... Um, uh, whole smart contract script having to be resubmitted to the blockchain every time someone interacts with it, which is what is happening at the moment. And so the the size, the disk space used by the chain is growing rapidly. Um, that will slow down to a sensible level again because of um, the upgrades that are coming. There's a whole load of performance improvements. Um, and one of the big things that's coming in now is the ability to... Um, actually it's there already but so um uh, uh, iog themselves are releasing a new um side chain uh, their own ethereum virtual machine it's like mill commodore which is a community team dc from dc spark they built out the Mac commodore side chain ethereum virtual machine side chain and now iog are doing their one so again you'll have a choice which is really good for any ecosystem to have choice because it means there's competition and um, there's you know people looking for vulnerabilities in one, then they'll report it to the other, and there's you know there's good uh, competition is good in any ecosystem because it forces um, good behaviour. Um, so having a couple of side chains working at Ethereum virtual machines will be good, um, and that will result in better interoperability with Ethereum, um, more tokens coming over, and um, yeah, just generally the Cardano is becoming richer and, and, and healthier. Um, so I'm looking forward to this hard fork. It's been um, installed now on the uh, testnet of Cardano. So um, they're running version of the nodes 1.35, 1.35.1 1 is coming out, which is a, um, a tidying release. Um, and that may well be the one that gets released then onto mainnet. Um, in a few weeks' time. Um, so on the testnet, all the blocks that are being minted with test transactions are um, now running the, the latest version of the code. And what they'll, they've, they've done that, they delayed the launch of it because they needed more time to run that testnet using minting those, um, uh, those blocks that are compatible with the Vassal hard fork. Um, and then they'll then do the same process again on the main net uh, in a few weeks' time. And some of them will have all these upgrades just appear. Um, and developers will be able to use reference scripts and input endorsers and pipelining and stuff like that, <laughs> which is all coming post Vassal Hard Fork. So it's a good time. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's nice to have this now even because we don't have all that inflation happening with the with the token price um so you can still buy cardano cheap uh and still benefit from the the upgrading technology whereas in september it was very much if you bought in then which a lot of us did and i did you know buy some in in that in that fluff period um where the value then gets lost and you have to sit and wait for longer before it comes back again um now whatever you buy you're still going to do well and there's probably going to be a, a slow rise starting soon um um certainly horizontal movement probably a slow rise in cardano i feel because of the the upgrades that are coming and the the recognition that cardano is getting in the wider world um as you know is represented by charles hoskinson speaking at a senate hearing um or committee so good times uh the other thing I want to drop in here is a link to my proposals. So Project Catalyst, which is the innovation fund, $16 million innovation fund, 
is um, in the assessment stage. So all the proposals are locked for Fund 9. Um, I've got five proposals that I'm involved in. Uh, there will be a, a, a while now as the proposals get assessed by the proposal assessors. Um, they will write comments against them and they'll come up with a, uh, yeah, an evaluation of those proposals. Then there will be the veteran proposal assessors come in and check that the process has been done legitimately. There's no bots being writing reviews. There's no, um, you know, too much, uh, like, unfair competition. People rugging, um, putting bad comments against proposals just because they're competitors. And that will be better than checked. And then they'll have a score given to all the proposals. And that will determine um, where they sit in the voting um, app itself. And so my, I'm hopeful that this time one of my um, proposals will get some funding and I can actually start building out some blockchain tech, uh, which is very exciting. So I've got my first one, Impact Staking. Staking as a service for good, which is the one that I've been um, working on for several months trying to get um, funding for, which will be a way to validate mission-driven stake pools who are who've got purpose behind them, whether that's uh, environmentally friendly or decentralization or charitable giving. Um, um, these these will be recognised um, that the payments they make to these to the you know the um, ecological movement or the um, charitable movements will be um, verified by third parties. So the party I'm choosing first is B1G1, which you know about. Um, and then on chain, we'll have a record of uh, activity happening and then real world giving um, validated by third parties, which I think is a really good thing to have. Um, and will hopefully improve the um the, ex the knowledge we have about the impact Cardano blockchain is having, having on the wider world, real world um, impact, and also will just give us as delegators confidence that who we're staking with is actually doing what they say they're doing, um, which is a, you know, working in a trustless environment is what we want to do in a decentralized world all the time. We don't want to have to trust individuals, we just have to know that there are there's a trusted party who can, valid, who can verify what they're doing. We've got Swarm Labs, which is an exciting thing to help fund um, e developers in the ecosystem um, uh, using a treasury system that will reward them for the work they do, will give them some job security, um, flattening out the fun-to-fun -fun peeps and troughs that Catalyst has brought, and um, potentially also bringing um, employment for people in local businesses that can give them that security of income, that can give them a, a paycheck and a credit a reference and um, give them the ability to pay rent and get mortgages, stuff like that that real people need to do in the real world. <laughs> that blockchain isn't really an option for you. If you're a full-time blockchain, um, as, as a freelance developer um, and you're being paid in crypto, then it's very difficult to you know, even get... Um, you know, become a tenant in a property because you don't have those pay pay slips that can get you there. So this will be a the long term. That's just, that's just the problem we want to solve for Catalyst. And DAO tools is related to that. Um, the ecosystem maps cool. That's a way to map out the whole growth of the ecosystem using a three D map, three D tech, a bit metaversy. Might just, I showed it last week. Might just show you again. Um, you went all here. Jump in and stop me if I'm boring you, by the way. Got this swarm. Can I, I, okay, so you're explaining the project, which uh, is good, but when, how do you vote? Yeah. It's just, you know, so I've got, uh, you have to have 500 ADA or something, which obviously I have, well, I have, because it's just your state to play seven pool. Yep. Um, so, I know you're, you're trying not to lead us, so to speak. It's a recommendation or giving information, and it's our choice. But my vote is probably sitting there doing nothing, mm -hmm. isn't it? Like, unless I actively go and click a button somewhere. Yeah. 
so the actual process for voting it requires you to uh, install a mobile app and the Catalyst voting app uh, and then registering with that to be able to uh, vote on um, vote on the Project Catalyst platform. So you'll oh, give. I've got that app. I must have done this before. Okay, cool. Well done. Like registered before. Mm -hmm. Um. So you'll have been given a QR code um, at some point when you signed up, probably, and that will be the the effectively how you then uh, um, register to vote when the voting it opens up. So, you know, I, I do intend to do some videos um, about this. So this is the Catalyst voting app for Android as an, another equivalent for uh, You can't iOS. vote at the moment. But you can't vote yet, no. So okay. what, once... I'm looking at this app and it says fund nine. Mm -hmm. And register now. So, uh, if you go through and try and register, um, it should indicate whether you had registered previously and whether you need to again. Uh, if you did it a long time ago, then you might need to register again. If it was in the last few rounds, then you, you won't have to. Um, it says you have to register, you need a Daedalus, a Yoroi, or an Ada Light. Or use command line utilities. Yeah, there's there's lots of obscure ways of doing it, but the the simple way is to, and I, I think you can do it from some of the younger wallets now, like Eternal as well. Um, um, so yeah, from the voting section. Now that looks all confusing to me. Yeah, especially I, if this is going to be something that. Um, how do you keep if you make a choice not to have apps, crypto related apps on your phone mm -hmm. you know, for a safety point of view this is when it's going to push you into buying that separate device or something isn't it um, you, you can vote with hardware wallets um, the, the only way to vote in Catalyst at the moment is um, with a mobile app so uh, you don't actually control your wallet from the voting app at all. They're two distinct entities. You never have to connect your wallet to the voting app. You just, um, in your wallet, you'll produce a QR code that you can then scan from your phone, from the voting app to register to vote. Um, and that gives the, the voting app enough knowledge to be able to validate that you have a wallet that has more than 500 ADA and then can vote. Um, so I'll, what I'll probably do is run through it um, in subsequent weeks how to actually get set up, um, and then you can and then you can participate in the ecosystem uh, with a vote. So this is this is the proof of concept for one of the proposals, which is an ecosystem map. So it will be a sort of interactive um, 3D world, a bit metaverse that you can jump into and explore which projects are out there and who's involved in what. So um, Gimbal Labs is a project um, team that I've been involved in for since I started in Cardano, really, um, 18 months ago. I go to their sessions every week, really good developers, good builders. Catalyst Swarm, um, uh, I'm involved with all the time as well. They are paying me now to be involved, um, which is really exciting. Uh, QI they are great documenters. And so we'll build this out into all the different projects going on. So you can actually go in and explore um, the projects from Project Catalyst and out into the, the wider Cardano ecosystem as well. And that's the goal and the dream, which is quite exciting. But yeah, registering to vote, I'll show you um, in subsequent weeks. It sounds like a really good thing to do. And then the final one is the one that might interest you. Um, Robin, because it's the Zimbabwean um, uh, project team. So their first venture into it is to train up accountants and lawyers um, in crypto tax and bookkeeping in particular. 
Um, and so this proposal is just to get there because they already run accounting training for US markets um, that's not crypto specific. Um, so they'll they want to create crypto specific ones uh, for different markets. Um, and this is a way to get get that funded, get it kicked off, um, get the first cohorts of students through um, and then really start to offer accountants and lawyers to the ecosystem that are desperately needed. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, I've put my name to this one, but I won't receive any funding from this actual um, project. Um, and I'm, I am working on one of their training courses um, that they are already running um, for UI UX. So in my role as a designer developer, I'm training on that course. And the company behind it are called Trellis. Um, they don't have a, a website as of yet. I think that's still a holding page, but you can look at the Outsource Zimbabwe one to get a wider feel on their LinkedIn pages. But yeah, good team. I like the guys in it. I'm working closely with them now. So there we go. Here's my five proposals. We appreciate your vote if you get into it. And uh, hopefully I can start migrating Fluid7 into more and more blockchain stuff. State pool's doing well. We've minted five blocks now. And um, um, I've got a new delegator this morning. I don't know who that is, whether it's one of you guys with another wallet or not, but um, they've come over from the Genius Shield um, pool. So uh, that was great to see. And our block production um, is being extra lucky. So we're doing well. Good. All right. Well, we've gone over 11. So any, any more last minute questions? If not, we'll probably wrap up. That's great, Jonathan. Thank you. And congratulations <laughs> for minting more blocks. Good. <laughs> <laughs> right now, uh, we're now well and truly written into the blockchain. We'll be there forever. <laughs> Fluid pool. <laughs> yeah. It's very cool. Good. Well, I hope all goes well with the property this stuff this week or this month or this six months, actually. And uh, <laughs> yeah, keep us updated. Thank you. Um, I've just registration in progress while you've been talking there. On uh, Catalyst. Euro wallet. I did the QR code. Magic. So you got one already. So yeah, that will let Let's you vote. Do these things outcomes. live as they're happening, and then I get them done. Yeah. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. And there's voting. Snapshot will take place on August 4th and voting starts on August 11th. Right. Perfect. Uh, good dates to have in mind. Um, so we've got some time to get trained up and play with it a little bit. But yeah. And if anybody wants to do a workshop in particular on, on something, do you suggest it and, uh, and we'll get it. We'll get it done. We can do it live. Um, in one of these sessions but other than that I think we'll wind up for the week and uh, I'll see you next next Friday brilliant right <laughs> I will be, um, yeah I may not make it next Friday so I think I'm okay. going to be um, traveling but, um, yeah but have a lovely weekend everyone and um, shall do thank you all I'll see you all soon <laughs> bye all right bye bye bye, -bye. bye. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh.